welcome uh, everyone who has joined today uh, today's session is uh, named three ways to your operating model can cultivate an agile mindset by yashashri and arun prasad setu uh, go ahead uh, the floor is yours thank you thank you shri krishna and hello everyone good afternoon good evening good morning thank you for uh, making time to attend our session and uh, arun and i are very excited to to be here uh, and share our learnings and our perspectives on the topic that we have for the day which is three ways your operating model can cultivate an agile mindset a very quick introduction um about us so my name is yashasri barve i am working as an agile coach and a transformation consultant at tata consultancy services in the software and professional services unit um i love to write blog i love to travel and uh, i have also authored a book called agile mindset magic stories from the trenches which is available on amazon uh, we have with us my colleague arun prasad setu he is from he is working as an agile coach and uh, unit agile leader and he is from travel transport and hospitality unit north america geography from tata consultancy services um and both of us are also a part of a very small niche construct within uh, within tcs which is uh, which we call as agile operating model neighborhood and uh, we have been investing for last couple of years time outside of our day job in uh, learning more and researching on operating models and especially agile operating models this is uh, also coming a lot from learnings from study of some really good mature organizations as well as some not so mature organizations to see you know what is working what is not working and what kind of um, operating model constructs are the ones that are really um, useful for us to follow so today we are bringing to you what we believe uh, are ways to um, cultivate agile mindset by changing certain things into your operating model over to you arun sure thank you yash uh, hello everyone uh, my name is arun prasad uh, so let's first you know come to a common understanding in terms of what uh, we mean by operating model right uh, so operating model is you know the way in which an organization is run uh, everything that it does um, right from sensing an opportunity uh, to the steps that it takes uh, to execute the policies that are defined the frameworks enablers uh, their approach towards people uh, their approach towards decision making uh, right so everything that is that is uh, involved in an organization in a day to day operations uh, is referred as operating model in this context right so that's the level setting in terms of what operating model means uh, for this uh, session now uh, let's understand why we wanted to actually go for an operating model transformation what is the need why is there a push now right we have not spoken about it earlier but why suddenly if you look at the last few years there has been a lot of talk for an operating model transformation let's understand the need for it um, so in the digital era we are in the middle of a turning point in the digital era where uh, the interaction between the enterprise and consumer is driven through digital devices across sectors so be it banking or retail or you know uh, travel insurance everything whatever you take the interactions are primarily driven through digital channels so that means uh, the ecosystem has changed uh, there is a fundamental change in the way how the interaction happens between the enterprise and the consumer so what used to be you know more of a human to human interaction probably years ago where you know people go to a bank talk to a person and then you know uh, get their job done but today it's it's driven primarily between a human to machine where you know i log into a website or i open up you know mobile banking app and then i do the transaction so this shift has happened right this shift has happened uh, you know uh, gradually over the years and uh, hence you know it is important for enterprises to really look at the current operating models and see what it can what they can do basically to stay relevant 
to respond to market changes uh, to grow and sustain by leveraging the ecosystem so that's at a high level in terms of why there is a need for operating model transformation now once we are convinced that there is a need for an operating model transformation the next thing will be okay what what in need we have to change right uh, is there an approach is there a you know what is it all about so there are few things one is the ways of working you know the way in which an organization works uh, the way in which how uh, you know it, it, it executes uh, their deliveries or it brings solutions to the table that is going to be the core of it right having an agile mindset the second layer or you know the the, the uh, middle layer will be about the uh, context in which the operating model uh, transformation needs to happen is it from an it perspective or a product perspective or completely from an enterprise point of view right so that's the second aspect of it and the third aspect of it is the frameworks and enablers that we are going to bring for this transformation now this is not the three things that we want to talk about this is just to give an idea of an operating model operating model transformation and how to approach it now let's go and look into what those three methods are uh, by which we can actually bring in a uh, agile mindset with an operating model structure so the first element in that is a flexible organization structure uh, right so you know traditionally if you look at uh, organizations uh, have evolved over a period of time and what has actually happened is there is a structure built in the organization the traditional structure is built in the organization now uh, this traditional structure has got some characteristics uh, having a command and control uh, mode of uh, working and then i you know uh, decisions will be made at a central level and most of the times people might not participate in the decision making processes and the teams there will be a constant you know uh, uh, micromanagement or you know there will be continuous need to manage the team effectively throughout to 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 get the deliverables out or to build the solutions and multiple things right the, the aspect towards learning so there is a structured approach traditional approach towards it uh, but whereas in a flexible structure what we mean by a flexible structure is where there is empowerment uh, there is you no know, uh, autonomy uh, the decisions are at least decentralized to an extent right which are local to the teams which are specific for them in their nature uh, decentralizing those decisions and the the collaborate mindset instead of you know uh, having a controlled mindset where people operate in a very controlled environment are uh, getting into a collaborative mindset right uh, that's going to be one of the key aspects of uh, a yeah, flexible structure in addition to that there are few other uh, steps like their approach towards learning uh, is it going to be a need based learning or is it going to be a continuous learning approach and how uh, you know they are they are uh, looking at you know success failure criteria are they having a mindset to do things differently and then uh, no it's okay to fail right it's okay to fail uh, so how are they having those type of mindsets right that that's what uh, you know we mean by a flexible structure uh, now i'll hand it over to yash you know she will be helping us to uh, talk how or explain how some of the organizations have adopted some structures which made them really flexible Over to Yash. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Arun. Uh, thank you for setting the context um, aptly. And we indeed have observed that uh, bringing in flexibility into organization structure goes a long way in setting the agile mindset and bringing in the required agility in the way the organizations operate. So we thought uh, we will take a couple of examples uh, and you know try to explain uh, what we mean by flexible organization structure to you. so um, charity begins at home right so let's take an example from our own home our second home rather which is nothing but tata consultancy services so um, pcs is it's a, is the is the largest it organization in india and uh, globally it has around 600000 more than 600000 people who are um, working uh, globally right and uh, 
at least the IT services unit, which is probably the bread and butter and the largest unit that we have in TCS, that is uh, very, very customer centric and it's very natural, right? Because it is a, it is a services unit. So the way the whole organization is structured is um, it is grouped as per domains that the customers operate in vertical units. So which is basically retail, banking, travel and transportation, or you know, software and professional services and so on. Within each of these units, we have customer engagements that are working very, very closely with the customers to deliver value. And this structure works very beautifully when it comes to the core thing that we are doing, which is basically nothing but value delivery to the customers. And it helps in keeping the customer satisfaction high. So the, the structure that we have, it, it, it works beautifully there. Now, um, there is another part to it, right? Like, because we are structured in units, anything that has to pass across units, let's say there is a customer ask that needs some information or some problem solving or some references, which is across units, there, then the unit structure becomes a barrier. Now, we, we wanted to find out, you know, what could probably be like we, when, when I say we, it is basically the agile network that we have within TCS, wanted to find an experiment, whether we can bring uh, any solutions to it in terms of bringing in any adaptive networks. So what we actually did is we, we created small niche constructs and we called it uh, neighborhoods. So we called it agile knowledge neighborhoods. And uh, these are the constructs that are of people who are passionate about a particular area, right? Agile ways of working in itself is a very, very broad area. So we created 14 different such structures that focused on specific aspects within the agile, uh, uh, agile operating. Um, structures to focus on certain aspects to do research and uh, to develop next gen next uh, practices to help customers or respond to any queries that come in and so on so these constructs are basically very very small uh, units so like for example arun is from uh, travel transport and hospitality i am from software and professional services we also have three more people radhika who is from manufacturing and animesh and robin who are from utilities who are all of us are basically working together outside of our day job into the agile operating model neighborhood and we are working and we are trying to further the cause of evolving the pieces point of views or helping the customers helping customers transform their operating models and so on so this structure actually and this is working very uh, it's, it's working beautifully it was a it was an experiment and it has really uh, turned out to be pretty well so far. And uh, what it has helped is it has actually helped us foster collaborative mindset across units, uh, try and see, you know, what is needed, try and inspect and adapt and accordingly, you know, modify and form new neighborhoods or dismantle existing neighborhoods that are not needed and so on. So it's a very, it's, it's a very uh, close to heart and a good example of, you know, bringing in flexibility, though we already have some kind of a structure that is adding value to the customers. I also wanted to take another example. Again, something that I have been um, working with a customer organization very closely. Now, this customer organization uh, basically ad has adopted the Spotify. Oops, sorry about that. Spotify as the scaling framework. And uh, of course, that, that means that you know they have structured themselves in terms of tribes and squads and chapters and guilds. Um, now, this is really helping them because they have a very good focus in terms of uh, how they are doing value delivery to their customers and uh, um, grouping together similar functionality squads helps them to you know, create those synergies. Um, after taking that transformation journey in a few, a few months and few years, they realized that they had too many tribes. And it was very difficult to create a synergy among tribes. So they they kind of inspected that and they adapted and they evolved to a new structure in which they introduced a new construct called domains. So several multiple tribes are coming together only when you know there are synergies among those tribes, and they are a part of a domain and several do so the IT organization now basically has several domains. This is helping to make the tribes autonomous and you know have the decentralized decision making that Arun was referring to, to, uh, to help the tribes to 
get faster decisions and you know get more autonomy in terms of the way they are structured but i wanted to call out you know apart from that uh, domain structure i wanted to call out uh, something that is outstanding that this organization has done which is basically the chapters so as you may have heard in spotify chapters are basically like small family of people who have similar skills so like for example in a tribe we may have a java chapter a data chapter a cloud chapter an agile chapter and so on a right? product management chapter and so on so uh, so we when we started this journey you know we we also formed chapters which uh, which were specific to a particular tribe um, and you know it was considered to be a way to develop the craft when people are in squads and uh, cross functional teams basically you know they they develop a lot of breadth because you know i also try to understand like as an agile coach i will also try to understand something about product management i will understand something about testing development and so on however as a as an individual as a professional i want to focus more on my craft and develop my competency which is what will happen in the chapter so we we had these uh, chapters at a tribe level and that really uh, was uh, was helping however we hit a barrier and the barrier is because you know as it, as is the case for any global organization um, there were people who were distributed across locations for these uh, chapters and then you know it conflicted with their squared priorities and you know it created some kind of a barrier and that is where we evolved into creating regional chapters and that really that was really helpful you know the the chapters are really thriving with this whole concept of regional chapters wherein the chapters are able to set their own okrs you know meet in person you know develop a rapport with each other really share and learn from each other and uh, build a really thriving community right and they are able to focus on the depth of their knowledge and they are able to actually uh, contribute to the learning culture and continuous learning culture i would say of the organization so um, so these definitely are helping in terms of uh, creating that culture of learning creating the collaboration culture so it is on top of you know the existing structures that we have um jez humble in his continuous delivery book says you know if it hurts then do it more often do it so much so many times that it actually uh, doesn't hurt anymore right and that that's the philosophy being behind the continuous delivery continuous integration constructs and that is also uh, that is also true i think in terms of you know evolution of the or bringing in fix flexibility in the organization structures and uh, we we saw a couple of examples you know one where there were structures built so that uh, it allowed people to thrive and not simply limit uh, making it a boundaryless organization and there were structures built that helped uh, teams to um teams to master their craft there were inspection and adaptation where people actually tried to keep the structures nimble and flexible and kept you know uh, changing those so the key is to evolve the structures every 3 to 5 years or even maybe even continuously for that matter so that we are always ready to change and we don't worry when we get hit by a pandemic and you know we have no idea what to do um this is probably you know one of the keys to staying relevant to the market needs um with that we have a quick question for you um we want to we would like to know from you hear from you which flexible constructs in your operating model have helped you to bring agility so multiple ways and arun please help to put the menti link in the chat arun can you please put that so you can either go to menti.com and use the code that is given 37503368 or you could simply use the link that is given here or if you don't like menti then you can simply put your responses on the chat so looking forward to hear from you on uh, which are the flexible constructs in your operating model that have helped you okay chapters any other constructs value streams mm -hmm. interesting communities of practice sure yes yes excellent yeah communities of practice is definitely so i think uh, shri krishna was asking us if we are a part of uh, center of excellence in tcs and uh, we are agilists right been in the agile world for a long time don't 
um, believe in center of excellence. We don't believe in um, best practices that have to be followed, but we are more promoter of next practices and understanding good practices from people. So, um, so yes, so it is more of communities of practice than the community than center of excellences for for agile teams. But yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and it's it's heartening to hear that you know you are uh, you are also finding value in chapters and value streams and uh, we are going to touch upon value streams later arun has a lot of experience in in building value streams for his um, um, his project so he's definitely going to talk about that um all right so with that uh, let us move on to the second section of our uh, talk which is basically about um, minimizing dependencies and maximize flow. And thank you for whoever gave value stream as an example, because that sets the right tone for our next uh, section. So over to you, Arun. Thank you, uh, Yash. Thanks for that. So I think you gave us a lot of you know real examples uh, from our experiences. That's good to know. Uh, so the second uh, you know, aspect or the second method is, uh, how do we uh, minimize dependencies and maximize flow? So what is a dependency? A dependency is uh, something you know which hinders uh, the flow of value to the customer, which hinders uh, you know or which slows down uh, the uh, the delivery of uh, products to the customer. Uh, let's now look at you know what this really means and why uh, you know there is a dependency or how the flow is getting impacted in the current structures. Uh, so if we take any enterprise, there will be multiple functions. Uh, marketing, research, uh, you know, uh, innovation, strategy, finance, you know, and then shaping and building the product uh, from you know from business and IT, and, and much more, right? So all these functions uh, are created for a special purpose, and those functions excel in their particular area of expertise, right? And over a period of time, what has happened is these functions. Uh, have been, you know, further elaborated into structures, and uh, there are different levels of hierarchies within these structures. You know, you have a chief marketing officer, then you have a chief uh, finance officer, then you have a chief uh, product officer, technology officer, and uh, IT delivery operations. Multiple structures exists in your enterprise, and this is how, you know, all these uh, structures will be there. And um, over a period of time, the the boundaries have become so you know strong, and the flow of information between these functions or departments often gets routed through the hierarchy. So, if people from one function wanted to interact with other function, then a lot of times what happens is you know they have to go through the hierarchy. Uh, assume that those blue dots, whatever you see on the screen, they are all you know different teams that have to come together for delivering a particular product or a solution to the customer. And uh, what happens is majority of the times, you know, the, the 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 information goes back and forth between these functions, and a lot of uh, hierarchies is involved in it, which makes you know the the time to take a decision or which makes the time to build solutions. Uh, are actually getting increased because of this hierarchy. Now you will see that you know we spoke about uh, structures, flexible and traditional structures, so something similar here. But uh, the idea is about the flow of uh, information, the flow of value in this uh, in this particular uh, item. So what uh, some of our customers have done is you know they kind of reimagine and they they did few items. One is they eliminated the waste in the entire processes. And uh, they kind of have something called as boundaryless structures, and they empowered as teams to be more self-organized, and uh, you know bringing in uh, lean thinking and mindset uh, into it. Uh, there are few techniques which you know we have seen from our experience. So the first one is, as one of you mentioned in the previous um, question, value streams, right? So organizing teams around value streams. There will be multiple, uh, you know, multiple uh, value streams which will be there in an enterprise, and uh, it's important to carve out all those value streams separately, and then come back uh, and you know form a structure around it. Uh, one of our travel customer uh, was actually doing it, and uh, that is something which you know safe prescribes value stream as a method, right? 
and uh, we have worked with the customer in transforming them into a value stream organization and that's a case study available in the scaled agile uh, website itself now similar to value stream there are other methods product centric organization is a method where uh, you know organize teams around products right uh, many of the equipment manufacturers telecom equipment manufacturers uh, fall into this category and you know it, it becomes very easy whenever there is going to be a merger acquisition or if they wanted to you know carve out a separate um, product and then you know make some changes or sell it off so it gives them that flexibility in terms of you know aligning in terms of products apple is a great example where you know they have their structures completely you know aligned across uh, multiple products and uh, similarly you know we have something called as customer journey uh, wherein you know uh, organizing teams or organizing uh, you know deliverables across customer touch points uh, if i want to take an example from the airline industry right let's say as a flyer as a traveler uh, we touch base with the airline in multiple channels so in the initial stage uh, you know through a booking we try to work uh, with them you know from their dot coms or from their mobile apps to make a booking and then when we go to the airport you know right we get you know we go through the process of you know check in and then uh, your baggage uh, drop and things like that and once you get on your flight you will be uh, you know experiencing your you know your miscellaneous services will you will be trying to avail some services be it wifi or things like that and finally when you you know when you go uh, out of the airport then you again go and claim your bags or you go into your transit so these are the different touch points through which uh, through which a consumer interacts with the enterprise and finally once you once you finish your travel then you claim your uh, loyalty points so there are various uh, you know journey or touch points which a customer uh, takes in the entire process and you know aligning uh, on those customer journeys is also another way of uh, maximizing flow by minimizing dependencies and finally uh, you know we have something uh, which is evolving of late on the power based structures uh, where you know the uh, self sufficient teams Um, or self organized teams comes together um, and then they work in close collaboration right they work in very close collaboration uh, to deliver uh, you know the value or product so that's how you know many of uh, our customers adopt into any of these models i'm sure you may have some more examples in terms of what models you know your customers are actually doing uh, these are some of our learnings uh, from of our experiences from whatever we saw from uh, many of our customers so now uh, let's understand from you uh, you know again uh, a quick uh, question in terms of uh, what uh, operating model does your organization or your customer follow uh, i'll again post that uh, main key uh, link here uh, just give me a second you can actually go in and then type your uh, responses for that or if you want you can type it uh, from your chat as well there you go okay so product centric right and we still have someone uh, on the project based model value stream is there okay anything else all right thank you thank you for the insights you know uh, product centric seems to be most used uh, right followed by value stream and then the other models thank you on over to yash thank you arun thank you for uh, taking us through the maximizing flow all right so uh, that brings us to the third way that we wanted to talk about which is basically purpose driven and uh, i i would say that you know for 
any of you who were a part of the first keynote that we had today um if you were there then i think my job is very easy to talk about purpose driven uh, i remember rajneesh mentioned that you know if the organizations have massive transformation purpose then it really helps the teams to be go beyond their usual contribution and you know things like that um i i think it is it is so important to have some purpose and build the way our structures are or our operating models are around those structures and that we have seen really working in in a in an amazing way in lot of organizations that we studied let's see some examples um i am i'm a fan of uh, this book of uh, i don't know why it starts automatically anyways so uh, i'm a fan of this book by daniel pink which is uh, called as drive and the surprising truth about what motivates us and i am a firm believer in these three motivators that we have and we did touch upon autonomy and mastery a little bit in our prior sections but here we wanted to focus more on purpose so purpose is working towards something worthwhile you know what working towards something which is really um contributing to the larger cause and when people understand what it is i think it is definitely something which is worth uh, worth working for right so yeah we will look at how even the business models have been built around purpose but uh, coming back to the ground reality of the teams that we work with right what are the various ways in which we can um, weave in into the operating model so that people are aware of the purpose i i i loved the fact that uh, when rajneesh said right that even in in the reward letters or the bonus letters that uh, their organization sends out they mention the purpose you know below saying uh, thank you for contributing to the cause of touching 1 million patients lives right so it it really makes people feel special and they they can relate to the purpose of uh, the higher purpose that they are working for there are certain ways that we have observed which really worked very well uh, one of that uh, is uh, objectives and key results so objectives and key results uh, is uh, something that has been made popular by google and its uh, silicon valley cousins sorry about that uh, google and its silicon valley cousins and uh, it is uh, being adopted by a lot of mature organizations as we see today okrs is being leveraged uh, i don't know why it is going i'm sorry about that okrs is being really leveraged a lot in uh, in a lot of these uh, organizations to ensure that there is a focus on outcomes and there is a oops there is a focus on outcomes and there is a focus on ensuring that even at the team level they understand how to create the objectives that they are working upon and not just work about um, sorry about that not just work upon only the tasks and the stories you know that they are supposed to work so in one organization that we have they had uh, okrs uh, embraced uh, you know in incorporated as part of their whole operating model so the organization defined okrs which were referred and the tribes got inspired from that and the tribes defined their own okrs and the way the whole okrs really help is you know when the teams tie their objectives to what the tribe wants to achieve and tribe ties it to what the organization wants to achieve everybody in the organization understands why they are doing what they are doing and that is very very powerful we also did a a massive uh, initiative within tcs to focus on business outcomes and uh, i i really was very happy when jeff talked about uh, outcome oriented product planning and the focus on the business outcome it, what is it what is the value that we are trying to achieve not just what we are doing and that actually helps to keep the razor sharp focus on what really matters and what matters most these business outcomes are not really just it outcomes like for example you know are we uh, what is our say to ratio or what is our velocity but something that is relating to the value that we are trying to bring to our customers like for example with our product how many invoices i mean just a hypothetical example how many invoices is the uh is the operations person able to process every day or how many people are actually visiting for example the passport seva kendra every day what is the customer footfall that the product is allowing the uh, the customer to fulfill amazing business outcomes uh, gives that razor sharp focus 
And the third thing that we wanted to talk about here was strategic themes. So a lot of our customers who have embraced SAFE, they follow this concept of strategic themes. And as you may have heard, or if even if you might not have heard about strategic themes, but the whole idea is at an organization level, there will be strategic themes, which will cascade down and help to prioritize to the epic level, the features level, and the story or the tasks level that the teams are doing. So everybody within the within the organization will be uh, understanding, you know, what are the what are the strategic themes that they are contributing to, which is like really a beautiful uh, way of um, understand ensuring that you know everybody understands the purpose. We also wanted to talk a little bit uh, about uh, business models that are driven by purpose. And um, this is in line with what uh, we had heard in the morning about, um, heard in the morning about um, organizations themselves having a business model, which is around purpose. Um, for example, Vitality is no longer just a medical insurer, but it is also an orchestrator of wellness. For example, Diamond Shipyards, they are repositioned themselves as a maritime solutions provider and not just a shipbuilder. Thomson Newton's no longer just an information services company, but they are purpose-led, trust-based answer company. Also Total Energies, not just producing and selling fuels, but they want to be responsible energy major, affordable, reliable, clean power. So these are basically the, this is the purpose that the organizations have thought for themselves. And that is what they are basically organizing their business model and their operating model around that purpose. And that really helps to define and you know create a great transformation blueprint, uh, transformation journeys blueprint for those organizations. I just wanted to take a very quick uh, example of vitality and what we mean by uh, you know, having the business model around the purpose. Uh, we consider, in TCS, we consider vitality as the poster child of the whole purpose-driven leveraging ecosystem uh, kind of an example. So, so Vitality, it's, it's nothing but an insurance company, right? So its touch points typically with the customers would be to, to sell insurance and then later the touch point will be for the claims processing. Now it reimagined itself, its business model as well as operating model to have, to become a wellness orchestrator. Now, what does this mean? It means that they've gone uh, got into a continuous engagement with their policyholders and they try to incentivize the protective or the preventive measures. Now, what does that mean? It means that if, if their policyholders were basically um, uh, taking into some fitness regime, right, taking into some healthy uh, lifestyle things, then they would be rewarded generously. And the rewards could be redeemed at various curated partner um, uh, partner points, right? Partner systems. Like for example, if I am a regular runner, I would get a good discount at, you know, let's say some health food store, or I may get a gym membership discount and so on. And that really helped it. It helped them to achieve outstanding outcomes like business. It was a win-win because vitality could reduce their cost and uh, the customers could actually, you know, be well, you know, not fall sick as uh, we were talking about in the morning. So this was uh, an, an amazing outcome that, you know, for the, for the consumers as well as for the customer organization that they brought in. Um, now coming to, you know, uh, we wanted to very quickly talk about um, a business uh, 4.0 framework that actually weaves in a lot of these concepts that we talked about. So one definitely is, you know, being uh, purpose driven that we just spoke about being adaptable, be flexible, and uh, also being resilient, which is which is very critical, something that we learned through the um, uh, COVID times, right? Business 4.0 framework actually helps organizations to sail through the new normal. And there are four pillars, agile, intelligence, cloud, and automation. These are the technical pillars, pillars on which the framework is based. And there are four behaviors, which is or consider mass personalization or the segment of one, create exponential value, not just incremental and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, leverage ecosystems, right? Like the example that we saw from Vitality and you know, embracing risk, not being risk averse, trying new things, experimenting new things and bring disruption, right? So we just wanted to touch upon nothing, um, nothing detailed and we, we will be happy to discuss if you have any specific questions around the business 4.0 but yes these this is a framework that is helping 
a lot of our customer organizations to thrive in, in, in these new normal times. All right. So that brings us to the closure uh, to, of this talk and um, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of being flexible, maximizing flow and uh, ensuring that we are building around purpose is what is helping the organizations to bring in mindset of collaboration, bringing in mindset of uh, value delivery, inspecting and adapting, continuous improvement, continuous learning, and all of these agility concepts and also bringing in its own agility into the mix. So um, we thank you very much for, uh, for being here and uh, listening patiently to our talk and also responding to our uh, questions in between and uh, happy to take any questions. I think there was a question which I think has was answered probably. Maybe I think one of you guys answered it probably. There were a couple of questions which are answered. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank Yashasri and Arun for a very enlightening session. Because this one thing we keep hearing about all agile mindset transformations, but then doing it in a organization with the scale of TCS, I think that has its own challenges. And it looks like you guys have really, you know, as you say, gone through the paces to get it through. And so that shows up in the in the talk as well. And I'm sure everyone has benefited from it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. India for the opportunity. I thank hope you. everyone had a good set, good lesson from this session. Thank you. Mm -hmm.